Hello, everyone. How are you? I am here to answer questions. I can answer questions on lots of different things, so feel free to ask away. There are a few topics that I'm particularly passionate about and happy to answer, quest answer questions about. So things like the Chaos Project and Open Source Project Health Metrics. I'm happy to talk about governance, leadership, careers in open source. So it looks like uh, my first question is about my work on the Chaos Project and how we use open source, open source project health metrics at VMware. So this is something that I am particularly interested in and quite passionate about, frankly. It's something that I enjoy doing. So my work on the Chaos Project, I'm a governing board member and maintainer for the project. So I help lead one of the, the working groups and I'm involved in a couple of the other working groups as well. So it's a, it's a great project. It's full of friendly people. So if you like data and metrics, it's kind of a cool place to get involved. It's also one of those projects that uh, you don't necessarily have to contribute code to participate to. So it's one of those projects that we're always looking for people to help us define metrics. So how do you use them? What questions are you trying to ask? What should a metric look like? And then we also then implement it in software. So we have Grimoire Lab and um, Augur, which are two of the software tools uh, along with Craigit that are part of the Chaos Project. So we have lots of tools um, that can, can help people uh, measure their project health. So uh, in the past, I've used Grimoire Lab a lot. Um, I decided uh, at VMware to give Augur a try. So that's the one that I've been using most recently. Uh, what, I, what I liked about Augur is that it allows me to do a lot of customization on the metrics. So it basically provides me with a backend. So it stores all of the data in a database and I can query it and do whatever graphs I wanna do around it. Some of the things that are important to us at VMware, I look at for our projects, I look at things like um, contributor risk. Are there enough people contributing to the project that if one of them won the lottery and went away tomorrow, would it still be, um, would it still be viable and would we still be able to maintain it? I also look at responsiveness. So one of the thing, one of the guidelines that we give people for um, for time to response for pull requests is two business days. So we look at that. I look at whether they're closing about as many pull requests as they get. And I also look at release cadence to see if we're um, releasing fixes, which to me indicates that we're also, you know, fixing security security issues and other things like that. Um, so there's another question about girls in STEM and chaos. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that it's, it's a particularly interesting um, project to contribute to for all kinds of different people. So I certainly think that, that um, women who are involved in, in STEM, so um, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, are particularly, I think, would be good for the chaos project. So I do think it's something that people can get involved in. We also do, you know, a number of uh, like Google Summer of Code and things like that. So if there are some people that um, that want to get paid to do this, uh, we can we can look at that the next time Google Summer of Code comes around. So I do think it's a really accessible project for for people from various um, you know underrepresented backgrounds. So my presentation, this is the other question, my presentation scheduled for later this week is about collaborative leadership and governance. Why is this important for open source projects? I think that there's, there are a lot of things that we maybe don't spend as much time thinking about as, as we should for open source projects. So collaborative leadership um, and, and, and governance is something that I certainly think a lot of us don't spend enough time thinking about. So you can look at I like, to, I like to frame things in terms of risk. That's how I frame my metrics. Things are higher risk, lower risk, but it's also how I look at a lot of open source projects. So I tend to look at things like, is it under a company? Is the project owned by a company or is it owned by a foundation? If it's owned by you know a nice neutral foundation like CNCF, the Linux Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, those are, those are great places to host projects and it's probably slightly lower risk than it would be if it's controlled by a company. For example, when you are basically at the whims of, of the company. 
And with it being under neutral foundations, you can you can get lots of people involved. You have, you know, contributors can move in from all kinds of different companies and you get this really sort of diverse group of people. And I think you can innovate better on projects that way. I think that's I think that's the reason Kubernetes has been so successful was because it was donated to CNCF where we could all contribute to it in a way that um, I think helped it get a lot of traction within the ecosystem. Uh, let's see, what makes a company a good open source citizen and open source projects? This is something we also spend a lot of time thinking about in, in VMware. And we've actually, our engineering team, along with uh, collaboration from the rest of the open source program office, has put together a really nice list of internal guidelines for how to be uh, how to participate well in open source projects and how to be a good corporate citizen. I think there are a few key elements um, in being a good corporate citizen in open source projects. One of them is that you you really do have to put the community first. So you've got this open source projects have this weird triad. So they've got individuals who are participating. A lot of those individuals are employed by companies, but they're participating in this community. So you've got this individual community company triad. And it's important for you to think about the, the company first, or the, sorry, not the company. Don't think about the company first, think about the community first. So what is it that the community needs? And if what you're trying to push through because it's what your company needs isn't what the community needs, you're, you're just not gonna win that battle. Um, you're gonna be frustrated and it's gonna be unpleasant and, and you lose employees that way, to be honest. So I think that really is kind of the key to being a good corporate citizen in open source is in what, you know, everything that you do, really thinking about what the what the community needs. Um, what do you love about working in open source? So I love this question uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's sort of funny. Like I, I grew up on a farm in Ohio and Everybody I knew worked in factories and on farms. That was that was my whole worldview, uh, to be honest, growing up. And I sort of ended up lucking into being able to, to go to university and get a computer science degree. And you know, my first job out of out of college was as a sysadmin for uh, it was Unix at the time. It was in the 1990s, and and this sort of launched this whole career for me. And because I was a sysadmin, I used a lot of open source projects. And then when I went to Intel a few few years later, they got me involved in a whole bunch of, of open source work. And what I found fascinating was that, you know, these these communities work really well. There's all this, this kind of there's all this structure behind it that maybe you've not not noticed if you're not involved in the community. But by being involved in these communities, I have met people all over the world. I, you know, if you had told 15 year old Don Foster that um, I was going to get to travel the world and go to lots of conferences and all kinds of really exciting places and give presentations about technology to other people. I would have been like, you're crazy. That is not a job. People don't pay people to do stuff like that. That's, you know, that's, that's fun. That's not really, not really something you get paid for. Um, but the people I've met are super interesting and I can realistically, I can go a lot of places around the world and, and I know people from these open source projects that I've worked in and I can get together with them for, for coffee or for a drink or lunch or something. And it's, it's really, really kind of cool because these are interesting people to talk to. They're, you know, they're fun to be around. And so it's just this, the people that I've met has just been, been fantastic and that fantastic. And that really, really is what makes the, what makes the community. Um, can you talk about the, uh, balancing the needs of the individual, the company, and the community within open source projects. I kind of talked a little bit about that because that is that is sort of the the triad that I was talking about earlier. But you know, as an as an individual, your your company has things that you want them to do. Um, the community has things that uh, make sense for them, and you as an individual have to end up balancing these two things. So how do I get things done that are things that, you know, the company is gonna pay me to continue to do this really awesome open source job, but how do I do those in a way that it's something that the community actually needs and wants and is gonna be, is gonna be interesting. And so being able to 
um, to balance that is 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 hard, um, but it's one of the things that will make you successful as an employee in open source. Um, so Christian Patterson asks, what role the foundation or project charter in fostering community or making and breaking community? Um, so I do think that the project documentation, the what I, what I would broadly call governance, um, so things like project charter, uh, decision-making documentation, things like that. I do think that that can make or break the community. So if I look at a governance, a governance doc or a foundation that maybe isn't, it isn't very neutral. It's completely controlled by a company or almost entirely controlled by a company. And it's not clear how I, as an employee of some other company or as an individual who's not employed by a company, how can I participate and be effective? And if I like it, how do I move into a leadership position? And if that's not clear, I think a lot of people just don't tend to participate in those, those types of projects. Um, because if you know, if it's something that you really love to do and you start to get engaged and it's just not clear that it's, it, it becomes clear that you will never really get to do any real work in that project because you don't work for the right company, I think is very um, disheartening to a lot of people. And I do think that that can definitely kind of make or break the community. Um, the other things that I think are important, things like, you know, code of conduct, good contribution docs so that people know how to contribute. Um, Yeah, and like, you know, contributorship, there's so much that you can do that I, you know, broadly kind of falls under governance that really can help uh, make the, the community great. Um, Denise, hello, Denise. Um, so Denise asks, uh, you went back to school recently. How has that new degree enhanced your boss journey? Um, yeah, so I, I had spent 20 years in tech. I, for my midlife crisis, decided that I was going to quit my job, move to London and get a PhD. And I was going to study collaboration within the Linux kernel as my um, as my project for my PhD, which was, which was loads of fun. It got me um, back involved in things that were more technical again. So this is one of those things you move up within the company, you start managing more people, and then you're managing more people. And then you sort of work yourself out of getting to do anything technical again. So what this gave me an opportunity to do was play around with the uh, Grimoire Labs tools, all huge data sets. I wrote piles and piles of Python code. Um, I also wrote piles and piles of R, which was uh, really kind of uh, terrible and horrible. Um, but but it was you know honestly it was it was a lot of fun because I got to play with data I got to learn interesting things and and I really did I really did en enjoy that you know and then going back getting you know going back into the the tech industry which was always my plan from the very beginning um, I you know I've been able to do a little bit more of the the metrics I've been able to kind of work it into my jobs uh, since then which has been which has been pretty cool. Uh, Christian asks what kind of metrics do you like to look at when evaluating community contribution? Um, yeah, so when I look at the VMware open source projects, there are there are really four things that I look at. So I look at I look at contributor risk. Are there enough people contributing that if one of them left, that we'd be able to sustain the community um, and the project? I look at whether we're merging PRs in a timely fashion or sorry, responding to PRs in a timely fashion. I look at whether we're closing about as many PRs as we open. So not, not necessarily merging them, but closing them. So even the ones that we aren't going to merge get closed in a, a timely fashion. And then I also look at releases, which I use as an indicator that we're, we're fixing bugs, we're applying security patches, and then we're you know pushing a release so that people can then easily, easily get those. So those are some of the things that, that I look at. And then we also look at things like, you know, does the project have a code of conduct? Are there good contribution docs? There's there's loads of stuff that I look at when evaluating community contribution. Um, Dirk, I feel like this is a loaded question from the boss. Um, how have open source communities changed in the last two decades that you've been involved? Um, so I have indeed been involved in open source for a very long time. Um, I think a lot has changed in open source communities uh, over those those two decades. So, you know, originally most of the communities looked like the Linux kernel. It was a mailing list, you sent patch diffs, um, and most of the interaction happened there. I think the tools have evolved significantly. So I think with the introduction of GitHub and it becoming so incredibly prolific within the industry, 
that's that's really changed the entire model for how we how we engage with people and how we collaborate on on projects. And so I think that the the tools have changed significantly. I also think that there is a um, a concerted effort to make these communities much less. Um, let's just say to make them much more accessible to people and um, a fun place to participate. So, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of the open source communities were super toxic, um, especially to, to new contributors. And there, you know, there wasn't always, a, you know, much of a push to get a lot of people involved. And, and when you did try to get involved, you, you know, people didn't treat you very well. If you were, if you were new and you made a little mistake or you didn't know what you were doing. Um, and so that I think, I think it was really hard to get engaged in open source projects. Contrast that with Kubernetes, which has a really clear contributor ladder. So this is what you do to get engaged in the project and move up within it. Here are the mentorship programs that we offer you. Here's the new contributor workshop that you can go to to learn how to be a new contributor. Here are the piles and piles of amazing contribution docs that you can read if you have questions about um, you know, any part of the, the contribution process. And here's the contributor experience SIG where you can go and, and you can ask questions and you can learn more and you can um, you can really get involved. So I really do think that um, that that's been the other, like that just the kind of culture of these projects and being more welcoming. And I still think we have a long way to go when it comes to diversity and inclusion in open source projects. But I do, um, you know, I am optimistic about the progress that we've made so far. So I do think we're, you know, moving in the right direction and just, Take some time. Um, so Cassandra asks, what are some successes that you can share? Some lessons learned that can be applied to someone's someone's own project. Wow, I don't even where to start with this one. One of the things, um, one of the things that I would say is that every open source project is different. So that's actually one of the things that makes this such an amazing job that I could do for 20 plus years is that um, every community that I work in is a little bit different. Um, but what that means is that I do think you need to be careful not to compare your project with other projects that are very different from yours, because it's easy to get discouraged. You know, my, my project doesn't have this, this other project has this. So, you know, I'd be careful about comparing the projects too much. But one of the things I would encourage you to do is learn from other projects and see how you can apply some of the changes uh, or some of the things that another project is doing back into your project. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the Kubernetes community before. It's always the example that I give people when they're looking to grow community. And because it really, they really have loads of documentation and mentorship programs and um, shadow programs where you can shadow somebody for, for a role and then maybe eventually take over that role. Uh, so they, they have all kinds of good things. So I'd say learn, learn as much as you can from, from other, other projects. Uh, Rob asks, did you ever encounter a community that drastically changed in atmosphere and culture? Um, that's a good question. I would say that none of the projects that I've been directly involved with have maybe drastically changed in, in culture during the times that I was involved with them. I would say that I, I do think that the Linux kernel has changed quite a lot. Um, when it comes to when it comes to culture from, you know, looking at it 20 years ago to looking at it now, you know, I certainly think there's, you know, still progress to be made, but, you know, they have a they have a code of conduct. They're involved in the outreachy program where they get, uh, you know, lots of really great interns who do cool work from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, so I do think the you know the Linux kernel is is certainly is certainly getting there. Um, I think the biggest one of the biggest challenges that they have is is kind of the the tools that they use. So it's not particularly accessible to people who aren't intimately familiar with how how mailing lists should work for open source projects, which makes it um, a little bit a little bit harder, I think, for for new people to to engage in in those projects. Um, yeah, I think that's probably probably the the example that I would that I would use, and I think we're are we out of time? I think this session ends at twenty five past, which is which is right now. So I guess I guess the session's over. So thank you all so much for coming. Come to my talk tomorrow. I'm going to talk about.
about a lot of the stuff that I talked about here. It's kind of focused on leadership and governance, but I will touch on some of the other things. So it should be fun. So join me. Thanks.